Something quietly significant happened over a corner of Cornwall that most people would struggle to find on a map. At Predanic Airfield, the Royal Navy and Leonardo UK put a full-size helicopter into the air, and for the first time in British naval history, there was no pilot in sight. Proteus didn't just taxi under remote control or hover with a human hand on the stick somewhere else. It ran an autonomous flight sequence where the aircraft controlled its own flying systems, while ground-based test pilots supervised the safety envelope. That distinction matters because it signals a shift from drones as gadgets to autonomy as a core building block of future naval aviation. Proteus is a name borrowed from Greek mythology, the shape-shifting sea god, and Leonardo picked it for a reason. This aircraft is being sold conceptually as modular and reconfigurable, the kind of platform you can adapt to multiple maritime missions by swapping payloads and altering autonomous behaviors. That's the sales pitch. The strategic question is sharper. If you can field a large autonomous rotorcraft that can operate alongside crewed aircraft, what does that do to the Royal Navy's ability to search, track, and fight across the North Atlantic without burning through scarce aircrew hours and expensive flight cycles? To understand why the Navy cares, you have to think like an operations planner staring at a very old problem. The ocean is huge, submarines are quiet, and time is always against you. Anti-submarine warfare is not a single dramatic find-and-kill moment. It's a relentless, data-hungry process of narrowing uncertainty. You build a picture with sonobuoys, dipping sonar, magnetic anomaly detection, radar, electronic support measures, and coordination with ships and allied assets. The bottleneck isn't imagination, it's persistence. You can't keep crewed helicopters airborne forever, and every hour you do keep them airborne costs money, maintenance life, and human fatigue. So what happens if you can hand a chunk of that persistence mission to an aircraft that doesn't get tired, doesn't need a cockpit, and can be configured as a sensor truck one day and a communications relay the next? That's where Proteus fits into the UK's broader narrative about a hybrid future force, sometimes framed as a new hybrid navy and linked to concepts like Atlantic Bastion, the effort to secure the North Atlantic approaches. In that vision, you don't replace crewed aviation overnight. You build mixed formations where autonomous platforms extend the reach of human-led units. The crewed helicopter becomes the quarterback, not the workhorse. It concentrates on the complex judgment calls, the tactical coordination, the moments where a human brain still has an edge. The autonomous helicopter becomes the multiplier, taking on the repetitive, time-consuming parts of the mission that don't require a person physically on board. Predanac is an interesting venue for this first autonomous flight because it's not just a random runway. It's tied to Royal Navy helicopter operations in Cornwall through RNS Caldros, and it's also positioned as a national drone hub for developing uncrewed and autonomous systems, especially those relevant to naval work. That combination matters because autonomy doesn't live in a vacuum. You're not proving a helicopter can fly in calm air over land just to win a press release. You're building procedures, safety cases, command and control workflows, and eventually ship integration. And ship integration is the real exam. Can the aircraft operate predictably around other aircraft? Can it obey geofences, react safely to unexpected obstacles, and handle degraded communications without becoming a hazard? Can it manage deck operations in the messy, windy, salt-laden reality of maritime life where perfect conditions are the exception? Proteus also isn't a sudden overnight invention. The roots go back more than a decade. In 2013, the UK Ministry of Defence funded early work on a rotary wing unmanned air system concept under an anti-submarine warfare spearhead effort. With experimentation using the SW-4 Solo uncrewed helicopter derived from a Polish airframe. A later development phase in 2017 expanded autonomy and mission relevance, and then the program stepped into a much larger bracket in July 2022 with a four-year, roughly £60 million contract. That contract, and the jobs it supports in the UK, tells you this is being treated as industrially meaningful, not just an R&D curiosity. It also places Proteus in a small global club. Full-size autonomous helicopters are rare, with the US example often cited as the S-70 UAS U-Hawk. When you hear comparisons like that, the message is clear. The UK wants a seat at the table in large, uncrewed rotorcraft, not just small drones. Technically, Proteus is fascinating because it's built on something familiar and then reimagined. The external design revealed in early 2025 confirmed it's structurally based on the Copter AW09, a light single-engine helicopter airframe, but modified for autonomous operations and larger payload capacity. You get a five-bladed main rotor, a shrouded tail rotor, and extensive use of composites and key structures to reduce weight and improve corrosion resistance. And then you remove what normally defines a helicopter in the public mind, the cockpit, the pilot, the human-centered interior. In their place, you pack sensors, computers, and software, the things that let the aircraft perceive the world, 
fuse data into a situational estimate, and then act on it. This is where autonomy becomes more than a buzzword. Proteus is described as having an integrated flight control and mission management system that combines navigation, perception, and decision-making within a redundant digital framework. In plain English, that means multiple layers of systems that can keep the aircraft stable, know where it is, and execute tasks without a person actively flying it. Rotorcraft stability alone is non-trivial. Helicopters don't want to fly the way fixed-wing aircraft often do. Add maritime winds, turbulence, and the unpredictable microenvironments near ships, and autonomy has to be robust rather than clever. It also has to be safe. The first autonomous flight being supervised by ground-based test pilots is not a sign of weakness. It's the normal path towards certification-grade confidence. Autonomy in aviation is not about bravado. It's about building trust through evidence. Then there's payload, and payload is where Proteus tries to justify its size. Leonardo's stated architecture is designed to support maritime search radars, electro-optical and infrared sensor turrets, magnetic anomaly detection equipment, sonoboy handling systems, electronic support measures, and communications relay packages. The payload capacity is described as exceeding one ton, which is a serious number for a rotorcraft in this category, and hints at a three-ton class configuration when you account for the absence of crew accommodations. If those figures hold up through testing, it means Proteus isn't just a camera drone. It's a platform that could carry meaningful sensor suites and stay on task long enough to matter. But here's the uncomfortable question that always follows autonomous systems. What breaks first in a real conflict? The most obvious vulnerability is the invisible thread connecting the aircraft to the wider force, the data links. If your concept depends on networked coordination with ships, helicopters, submarines, and allied sensors, then electronic warfare becomes a central threat, not a niche concern. Jamming, spoofing, cyber intrusion, and emissions tracking all become part of the tactical environment. So autonomy has to include graceful degradation. What does Proteus do when the link quality drops? Does it continue the mission on a pre-approved behavior set? Does it return to a safe area? Does it land? And crucially, can commanders trust those behaviors under pressure when time and uncertainty are worst? There's also a deeper cultural shift inside navies. Crewed aviation has a century of norms, procedures, and hard-earned instinct. Autonomy demands new doctrine, how you task it, how you supervise it, how you integrate it into airspace control, how you assign accountability when something goes wrong. The first flight at Predenac is not the finish line, it's the moment the program transitions from we think it should work to prove it works repeatedly in harder conditions with more complexity. And if it succeeds, the payoff is strategic. It's not just another aircraft type. It's a different way of generating maritime aviation mass, more coverage, more persistence, more options, without proportionally increasing the strain on pilots and crewed fleets. So the real significance of Proteus isn't that a helicopter flew itself for a short sequence under supervision. The significance is what that flight implies. The Royal Navy is testing whether the future of maritime air power is a blended ecosystem where humans lead and autonomous systems extend. If that hybrid model holds, then the Navy doesn't just get a new platform, it gets a new set of choices. And in the North Atlantic, where distance, weather, and underwater threats have always favored the patient hunter, choices are everything.